Tonight, here's the headline in the New York Times. Quote, accused of echoing fascists, Trump campaign warns its critics will be, quote, crushed. Accused of echoing fascists? I mean, you either are echoing fascists or you aren't. <laughs> Despite the sort of the pulling the punch element of that headline, the subheadline on that story tonight in the New York Times does get there a little more directly. The, sub, the subhead uh, says, quote, the former president likened political opponents to vermin, similar to the dehumanizing rhetoric wielded by dictators like Hitler and Mussolini. Uh, the Washington Post headline just got there more directly. Headline, Trump calls political enemies vermin, echoing dictators Hitler and Mussolini. The quote from Trump was this. He said, quote, we will root out the communists, Marxists, fascists, and radical left thugs that live like vermin within the confines of our country, lie, steal, and cheat on elections, and will do anything possible, whether legally or illegally, to destroy America and the American dream. The threat from outside forces is far less sinister, dangerous, and grave than the threat from within. The threat from within, the vermin. Um, former president made these comments in a Veterans Day speech. They did not appear to be ad-libbed. They appeared to have been written as part of the speech in uh, something he read off his teleprompter, by all appearances. Even if, by some chance, they weren't in the teleprompter for that speech, he certainly made clear that he meant them for sure, and he meant them just like that when he put them in writing in a social media post that used the exact same language, that used that same word, vermin, after he, developed, after he delivered the speech in, in, in New Hampshire. And this is not subtle, right? I mean, everybody knows what this means. If you know one thing about mass murdering dictators in history, it's that they refer to the people they want to mass murder as vermin, pests, rats, insects, termites, right? Anything to make their followers see those people as mm, something to be exterminated, not someone you might know. Professor Ruth Ben-Ghiat, who's the author of the book Strong Men, said today, quote, all of this is part of his effort to re-educate Americans to see violence as justified, patriotic, and even morally righteous. But to get people to lose their aversion to violence, savvy authoritarians also dehumanize their enemies. That is what Trump is doing. Trying to get people to lose their aversion, their natural aversion to violence. And this, this comes at a time when the Washington Post, of course, has recently reported that Trump's advisors are working on a plan to invoke the Insurrection Act on his first day in office, which would give him the power that the pro-Trump paramilitaries were calling for ahead of January 6th, it would give him the power from day one to use the U.S. military, the U.S. Army, against American civilians on U.S. streets. It comes at a time when the New York Times is newly reporting, as of this weekend, that Trump's advisors are planning to build camps in the United States, camps capable of holding millions of people once he is back in office. They plan to put millions of people in camps in the United States, and they plan to do it using the military rather than by passing some new legislation that might make it seem legal. They plan to just do it unilaterally, again, using the military. Building camps to hold millions of people, using military force against your own people, saying your political opponents are vermin who must be rooted out and crushed to save the country. None of this is subtle. And apparently none of this is an accident. These things aren't being blurted out accidentally, right? They're in the speech. They're in the social media posts. These supposed plans for the new administration are being technically leaked. I mean, as of tonight, the Trump campaign put out a statement officially disavowing all reported plans. But these supposed leaks are also accompanied in many instances by on-the-record interviews with some of Trump's most senior advisors, people putting their name to it and explicitly confirming these plans. And, and, and just, again, to be clear, this talk about exterminating the vermin in this country it was not an ad lib. It's a repeated line now. He wants to be known for this. He wants everybody to know that this is the language he is using. And the fact that it's all happening at once, the reporting on the camps they're going to put people in, the military force against civilians, the vermin speech and all the statements about it, the fact that it is all happening at once presumably means it is not an accident, that they are rolling this out now on purpose. Because why? because it's exciting to his followers, right? The transgressive thrill of yet more lines being crossed, more people being shocked and scared and insulted and offended. That's the transgressive thrill of Trump's radicalism. 
Yes, it's an effort to intimidate his opponents, but also to excite his followers, especially as he really does seem to be trying to get them excited about the possibility of cathartic violence against Trump's enemies. And he knows he's going to get called a fascist for talking this way, for, for, for proposing things like this. He's inviting it. And he's calling all of his opponents fascists, too trying to rob that word of its meaning. Call me a fascist, and then I'll call you a fascist, and then it'll, that, that word will become something that we throw around and it doesn't actually attach to anything real, and we'll thereby rob it of its power. Sure, call me a fascist. I'll call you a fascist, too. I mean, that's where we are. And so, so here's, here's the question. What is the institution in our country that is going to find that intolerable? And that is going to see this as something that's happening on its patch, which it needs to fix. What is the institution that's going to feel the need to self-police when it comes to somebody speaking on their behalf like this, espousing these kinds of things, right? There's no church here to shut down a, a, a Father Coughlin or a Bishop Strickland in Texas. There's no judiciary to launch an ethics inquiry like you might of a judge. There's no criminal law springing into action here. As Americans, we, of course, have the constitutional right to espouse and say even the worst political ideas without committing a crime by doing so. There's no, you know, bar association to yank his law license. There's no radio or TV network to say, we're not hosting your show anymore. What is the institution here that decides this is on their patch? What is the institution here that decides that you can never espouse things like this and also be part of them and also represent them? There is only one. It's his political party, which, when he is running to be the Republican nominee for president of the United States, means that he's contending to leave that party while promising that he will build camps to hold millions of people in this country, and he will use the military against American civilians at home in America, and his political opponents are vermin who will be crushed and exterminated. That is the test here. That is the only, he's not running as an independent. He's not running as the Trump for president candidate. He is running as the Republican. He wants to be the Republican nominee for president. And so that is the only institution. That is the institution that is being tested here. This is him testing the political party that he says he's going to lead, testing them now, one year out from the election, to see what they will tolerate as an institution. Which means every single member of that party will not have to answer whether this is who they are, whether this is what they stand for, whether this is the cause of their party. We know from history that a country under threat does not stand up for itself amorphously with some sort of inchoate civic objection that just redounds to the population at large. It works that way like in fiction and poetry. In real life, a country under threat stands up for itself when the institutions that make up the civic and political life of that country stand up and say what they are for and what they can no longer stand. There is only one institution in this country that is implicated by what he is doing, and he is testing them. And that is the point where we are now. He has forced it there. What now? Today, we also learned of the death of former President Trump's oldest sibling, uh, his older sister, uh, Marianne Trump Berry. She was a respected federal judge in New Jersey for most of her career. She was on what's called senior status on the bench when her younger brother was elected president in 2016. Senior status is a sort of semi-retirement that federal judges can stay in basically forever. But Marianne Trump Berry did a very unusual thing when her brother was president. She gave up senior status and resigned from the judiciary altogether. That was in 2019. It happened right after the New York Times exposed her role in what the paper described as a decades-long pattern of the Trump family engaging in what was alleged to be massive systemic tax fraud. Uh, Judge Barry was alleged to be not just a financial beneficiary of the family's tax fraud, but, quote, she was in a position to influence the actions taken by her family. Now, that is a serious moral and potentially legal allegation against anybody in any line of work. But if you're a federal judge, that is a serious ethics allegation for a sitting federal judge. 
mean, those kinds of allegations, if proven, would certainly violate the judicial code of conduct that applies to all federal judges other than the Supreme Court. Um, and, and so in the wake of the New York Times reporting on Judge Barry's involvement in this massive alleged tax fraud with her brother, President Trump, and other members of the Trump family, the court that she sat on actually started investigating this as an ethics matter. And 10 days after the court confirmed that they had started investigating her for this alleged ethics breach, she resigned from the bench. She gave up her lifetime tenure as a judge. That is the one sure way she could call off that investigation because judicial conduct rules don't apply to retired judges. So she retired suddenly and without explanation 10 days after the investigation was announced and that killed the investigation. It is honestly one of the most serious substantive scandals ever associated with a presidential family member and we have had some doozies. But I mean, a lifetime, giving up lifetime tenure on the federal bench to avoid the investigation into the serious decades long tax fraud allegations laid out against you with documentation in the New York Times. Specifically, it seemed designed in, that retirement designed in such a way to stop the investigation and let her get away with it. I mean, that, like I said, we've had some doozies when it comes to presidential family members' ethics problem, but this ranks right up there. That said, with this particular former president, this was like the 489th most serious scandal associated with him. And so it instantly became totally obscure trivia, basically, as soon as it happened. But it happened. And Marianne trump uh passed away last night at home in New York City. She was 86 years old. And I, I tell that story in part because I think there's an, there is an important point here that relates in some ways to today's news. And it's the point about an, an institution, in this case, an institution like the court, policing itself. Right? There was no criminal case that was ever brought based on the Trump Organization alleged fraud that was described by the New York Times in that series back in 2019. And no, I don't know why that is. I don't know why that was never the basis of a, a prosecution of Trump or his family members or his business. But whether or not there were ever going to be criminal charges brought against Judge Barry or former President Trump or anyone else involved in that alleged fraud, Still, you had this, this institution, you had the judiciary, you had the court itself where Judge Barry worked, starting an investigation into the matter. And that investigation, depending on how it went, could very well have resulted in her being censured as a judge or reprimanded or even impeached and removed off the bench. And the reason that sort of sword of Damocles was hanging over her and that forced her into an unexpected retirement as a judge is because that institution decided to police itself. The judiciary has an interest as an institution in policing itself, in maintaining its own standards, in policing its own members to make sure they stand up to the values that are professed by that institution. And that dynamic, institutions policing themselves, upholding their values as institutions, policing their own members, holding their own representatives accountable for violation of the rules and the ethos of those organizations, regardless of the legal issues, regardless of the criminal law, that institutional self-policing is a really important thing in our country and in every other. Quote, the absence of a code has led in recent years to the misunderstanding that the justices of this court, unlike all the other jurists in this country, regard themselves as unrestricted by any ethics rules. To dispel this misunderstanding, we are issuing this code. See, they're only doing it to dispel this misunderstanding about how closely they have been following the ethics rules. See, paying off a Supreme Court justice with like an RV or buying his mom a house or the private jet and yacht trips. That was all a misunderstanding by us, the American public, about just how ethical that really is or something. Uh, joining us now is Dahlia Lithwick. She's legal correspondent and senior editor at Slate. She's also the author of Lady Justice, Women, the Law, and the Battle to Save America. Dahlia, my friend, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Good to see you, Rachel. How do you see this news that the Supreme Court has for the first time issued an ethics 
note, an ethics advisory <laughs> that is apparently for us, but maybe not for them. I, I like to think of it as an ethics aspiration. Like it's it's a little it's a little wish casting. Uh, it's the court saying, it's not us, it's you. You misunderstood our ethics rules. And so let us explain again, these long-standing ethics rules that we have not abided by, but if we explain them again, you'll understand. Listen, you're right to be cynical, Rachel. And I think I wanna say something in the vein of what you and Michael Bashloss were just talking about, which is it, feels like it's a joke that this is how institutions police themselves, but it matters a little bit that the Supreme Court, for the first time in history, responds to an American public that demands that it police itself. Hmm. And so I'm not happy about these rules, which are purely advisory, which everyone is going to tell you <laughs> has no enforcement mechanism that feels like more of the justice gaslighting us and telling us that we misunderstood the ethics rules all along. It matters a little bit to me that Justices Kavanaugh and Barrett and Kagan and the Chief Justice think this is important enough to do right now. And so I want to be as grumpy as you are, because <laughs> these are not real rules. But I also want to signal that I think as far as institutions policing themselves go, the fact that the U.S. Supreme Court, for the first time in history, takes note of American public fury at its ethics violations matters a tiny bit. Yeah, the responsiveness itself is an important part of the story here, and them recognizing that their legitimacy does depend on us believing that they have legitimacy um, and that our opinion as a public matters. I, I take your point. On that, on on the specifics of what they put in print today, is did they clarify their ethical rules in any way that would make a difference in any of the high, in a high level headline scandals that we've seen that really do seem just like plain corruption and bribery scandals among a number of these judges? No, no, it's the very opposite of that, Rachel. This is, to the extent that courts are meant to promulgate rules that either mean something looking backward or going forward, this does neither. <laughs> looking <laughs> backward, it seems to exculpate the worst behavior we've seen. And going forward, this isn't a pledge or a promise. This isn't binding, as everybody has said. There's no mechanism by which to investigate or enforce these rules. So this is really like it's a hallmark card from the court to us saying, like, trust us this time. We're really going to adhere to these rules that we promise we've been here to all along. Nothing about this should make us feel good about going forward, uh, justices, committing to something because they will all decide for themselves. So, no, this isn't a, a, a code of ethics that can be cast in amber to mean something. I think it signals a court that wants to be in some kind of conversation. Conversation is a generous word. Let's call it a sermon on the mount. <laughs> but, like, I think an attempt to say, holy cow, our popularity ratings are plummeting. Our behavior has been appalling. People get that. They don't think there should be a, a scenario in which multi-billionaires are uh, determining what cases come before the court and how those cases are decided. They get that now. And I think that the fact that Justices Thomas and Alito don't fully sign on to changing their conduct isn't the end game here. The end game is a court that feels that it has to answer to us. And I think that matters a little bit. I hear you, and I think that's right. Um, Dolly Lithwick, that's, that's the kind of conversation that I really I've always enjoy having with you. You always teach me something. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Back at you, Rachel.